May it please the court, Co-Counsel. Co-Counsel. Uh, good afternoon, members of the jury. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I first wanted to thank you uh, for your service this week. I can imagine uh, how difficult it's been uh, being away from your family uh, for the past several days. Uh, I, I, I can imagine that none of you thought that you would be here. during this trial. I told you on Tuesday morning um, that this case, there is no doubt that someone committed capital murder. Someone killed those two boys. And this whole trial has been, who is it? Who is it? Who was the person riding in that car? that shot those 22 caliber bullets. And we talked about just how difficult a case, this case was to solve, to investigate back in 1993. We heard, uh, I know you've seen this map a ton of times and I think we're all pretty familiar on what exactly, or at least the events that led up to the shooting down Electric Street. The boys were here at a party on Jamaica. They didn't want to walk home because their friend Hector Ochoa had not returned to drive them home to pick them up. They were, they were a little intoxicated, and as they were walking down this way, at east on Trans Mountain, a car came up to them, passed by, slowed down, and it stopped. And they approached it because they thought it was Hector. And it wasn't. And then it drove away after messing with them for a little bit. Understandably, they were upset. That would make them upset. But they continued walking. And right here, once they get to Electric, they cross. And they're walking in the dirt lot. And that car comes back. Or they think it's the same car. But this time, they know it's not Hector. They know it's not Hector. And so they approach it in a fighting mood. They're upset. And they start yelling at the car. Both Juan Medina and Jesse Hernandez told you, we started yelling at the car. I think the testimony was that Robert England uh, said, you know, your mama. And Jesse Hernandez testified that what the response was from the car was, que putos. This is not a, a, a friendly interaction between the boys and this car as they were approaching it. And the shots, they started coming out. And it wasn't a big gun, it was a small 22 caliber. And it was parked right about there. And we know the boys, they started scattering. And they went in different directions. You'll recall that was the testimony. Mr. Hernandez and Mr. Medina ran up this way. The shots that were fired on the diagram. Now, Mr. England was found way over here, about 50 yards, 148 feet from the casings. And he had received that bullet wound from the back of his head, and it exited out this way as he's running along that fence line. The person that has the more interesting injuries, we know, is Armando Laza. Because Armando Laza was able to make it to this house here at 10,000 Oakland. Now he's got this bullet wound here to his stomach, but the more interesting wound is this one here on his leg. The entry was on his inner left thigh, here. And it exited in the middle of his left thigh. And it was going upwards. It was going upwards. Now, this is a weird wound. How would a bullet that's being shot out straight like that hit somebody 
who's running or walking away or standing upright, how would it go upward? And it's because I submit to you that Armando Lazo was not standing up. He was not running away when this second shot was fired. He was on the ground. And that's important because you'll recall, and we'll get to that in a moment, what does the defendant tell David Ron Hill? I saw Lazo, he fell down, he got back up, he started running towards the house, and I went and shot him again. I went and shot him again. That's what he told David Ron Hill. That's why this injury is so important. Because Armando Lazo could not have gotten that standing up. Where was the defendant in the early morning hours of April 10th? We heard from Officer uh, Rivelas, who told you hours, three hours, about three hours after that electric street shooting, about 3 a.m., there was another police call in the defendant's neighborhood, right next to his house. And where did Officer Rivelas go? He goes there, and what does he find? The defendant is outside with his two friends, Marcos Gonzalez and Rodney Williams. And he asks them, what's this deal with the shots? Where'd they come from? What happened? And they blow them off. Nothing. Nothing happened. Everything's cool. Everything's cool. No problems here. Little does Officer Rivelas know. And what does he tell them? Go inside. You and Marcos Gonzalez go inside Daniel's house, and Rodney will give you Rodney, I'll give you a ride back to your apartment. This is less than three hours and less than three miles away from the shooting on Electric Street. We know he's hanging out with those guys that night. And what else do we know about them? We know that they're V and E gang members. Okay. The defendant tells that to David Ronhell. He tells you, I was with Marco Gonzalez and my other homeboys from v and &E. And one of the defendant's own exhibits, exhibit, defense exhibit number nine from the jail, shows you. He is a gang member. Keeps set from BLH because he's a v and &E gang member. I don't think there's any doubt about that. That's who he's hanging out with. Those are his homeboys. And that's important because what does Angelica Hernandez tell? She's 15 years old. She's at North Park Mall with her friend. They go to hang out to watch movies. And three guys, three guys approach them. And they tell them, she, they tell her, we're from V&E. We're V&E gang members. And we did the shooting. We shot those two boys. And she's scared. And she wants to leave. And they do leave. But she tells you the thing that she remembers the most is that the defendant was the most talkative of all the three of them and that she remembers that he was the lightest skin. And why is that important? We heard from David Ron Hell that Marcos Gonzalez, well, he, he's a bit dark. I think the word that Mr. Ron Hell used was indigenous. Do you recall that? And, and he testified that Rodney Williams uh, is African American. And you can see the defendant here, he would be much lighter skinned than both Marcos Gonzalez and Rodney Williams. And we asked her, ma'am, why, why don't you report this to the police? Why does it take you so many years to come forward with this information? And what does she say? She says she didn't go to the police 
because she saw that they were arrested, that the defendant was arrested the next day. That's why she didn't go. Because she thought, well, they got him. Before I go on, I want to briefly talk about, because I think this is for sure going to come up, is how to request testimony from witnesses. Okay? You cannot send out a note saying, we would like all of David Ronhell's testimony. You cannot do that. That we will, the judge is going to send you a note back saying, can't do that, or just continue deliberating. If you want testimony back, and I'm sure you will, you have to specify that you have a dispute. You have to say, we have a dispute about X, or we have a dispute about Y. And what would be even better is if you can say, you know, some of us think we heard this, some of us think we heard that. So, for instance, on Angelica Hernandez's testimony, I think it was pretty clear that she testified. The guys told me they were from v &E. I hope all of you remember that. But if you don't remember that, you can send out a note and say, some of us think she testified that they were in v &E, and some of us don't remember that, or some of us have a disagreement, or some of us uh, you know, thought she said they were from some other gang. Okay, and so if you send that out a note, uh, Natalie can find that part in her testimony, type it up, and send it back to you. But you would have to do that anytime that you want testimony, you have to identify a specific part that you are in disagreement about. Okay? Personally, I think this is the, one of the key questions in the entire case. How did the police know to go and find David Ronhell? David Ronhell testified that the police called me wanting to talk to me about my telephone harassment. They wanted to talk to me about my case. That's what they told me and that I showed up at the police station, and they took me from the Northeast Police Station to the one here on Montana and Rayner, and all of a sudden they started questioning me about the murder. They started accusing me of doing the murder. And when they kept asking me, did I do it, did I do it? I said, no, I didn't do it. But my cousin, Daniel Villegas, he told me he did. He told me he did. Now, I, Mr. Ronhell tells you this because he doesn't want to admit I came forward to the police. He does not want to admit I told the police this information. I came forward with it. He doesn't want to admit that. But how would the police know that he had information relevant to this case? How would they know that? How would they know to look for David Ronhell? He lives in the Lower Valley. He goes to Del Valle. He had a telephone harassment. What, what are the police gonna do? Pick up every single person wanted in El Paso on a misdemeanor telephone harassment and bring them all in and say, we know you did have information about the shooting. We know you have information about the shooting. We know you have information about the shooting. It doesn't make sense. Why would the police pick David Ron Helm? Out of all the people in El Paso County, how would they get so lucky to know that he had information incriminating Daniel Villegas? And it's because he came forward. David Ron Helm came forward to the police. And he came forward because he knew his cousin was telling the truth. He knew the defendant was telling the truth. He was not joking. And David Rondell knew that. Mr. Lodore, you've gone 15 minutes. Thank you, Judge. 
I want to cover very briefly what David Runhell is saying the conversation between him and the defendant was. Because there is no <coughs> doubt, no doubt, that the defendant told him he did. They both admit that. There is zero doubt that, that conversation happened. The defendant told him that he was with Marcos and his B and E homeboys. The defendant told him that he was passing by the group and that he recognized Mondo from Boomerangs. He told David Runhell that he stopped next to him, that he stopped next to the group. He told them that this group was throwing ECH. And why is that important? When you look at those newspaper articles, ECH isn't anywhere in them. That is a detail that had to come from the defendant. Juan Medina told you, people often thought, I was in ECH. I lived in, in the Eisenhower uh, projects. I associated with ECH members. And what else does he tell you? He tells you that Bobby England was wearing, I'm sorry, he tells you that ECH's color is blue. And what shirt is Bobby England wearing? He's wearing a blue shirt. That's why he thinks they're an ECH. He tells his cousin, David Runhelm, that they left, they circled around the block, and came back. He tells David Runhelm that he wanted to shoot at Mondo, but that he missed and he hit the guy next to him. That he saw Mondo get back up and run towards the house. And that he, had, that he shot him again, that he shot him a second time. He tells David Ronhell that he was the only one who shot, that Marcos did not shoot. And David Ronhell testified that when he asked the defendant what he had thought or about doing it, that the defendant told him he was too drugged up. He said these things. No doubt, David Ronhell tells you that that is what he told him, and that is uncontested. Who would, they, who would say that? Who would say that? We talked a lot uh, in Vordaer about, you know, try to imagine having a family member as an accused and the protections that we afford them. You have family members that are going to confess to capital murder who are going to tell you, I shot two boys? Who does that? And ask yourself this about Oscar Gomez. How would the police know that Oscar Gomez had a conversation with the defendant about the shooting? How would the police know that? Unless Oscar Gomez started telling people, I, I've spoken to Dan, and this is what he told me. The police aren't just going and plucking people out of thin air. People talk. People talk. And this morning, what did Oscar Gomez tell us about the conversation that he had with Daniel Villegas? Oscar Gomez told you that the defendant and him, they spoke over the phone, and that the defendant asked him to come over to his house because he was going away for a long time. That is not in dispute. That is not in dispute that that was said. Oscar Gomez told you that. Oscar Gomez told you, I remember asking him, did you do the shooting? Did you do the shooting? Now he testified here, in front of all these folks, in front of the defendant's family, in front of the defendant. Well, now I don't remember. I don't remember how he answered. I know for sure I asked him the question, 
but I don't remember if he laughed or he grinned or I don't remember what he said. Do you believe that? That Oscar Gomez would remember everything else about this little conversation, but at the critical factor about how the defendant answered, he doesn't remember. But back in 2014, he did. is not working. I hope you caught it during the testimony. He says, I asked him, did you do it? And he said, yes. And he's had a grin. And he had a grin. And I told them, that's fucked up. I, I hope you got to see that. Because the interview, the interview that, that they had, that's not the evidence, okay? It's what you saw and what you heard. His words condemn him. Why does he tell these people over and over and over again that he killed these two boys if he wasn't the one who did it? The statement to Oscar Gomez, that was even after he'd been arrested, after he'd already been in jail, after he had already gotten out on bond. And he says, let's hang out because I'm going away. He knows what he did, and it's his words that give him away. And for that reason, I'm asking you to find him guilty of capital murder. Thank you.